Okay, hello everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming to our session. Uh, we appreciate there's a whole bunch of really good sessions, so, uh, so thank you for, for joining our one. Um, my name is Simon Maple, this is my colleague, Oleg Schleif. Hello everyone. And uh, this is a session on Good Cop, Bad Cop Guide to Java 9. So who's heard of Java 9 so far at Java 1? Most people, I would expect that uh, on a Wednesday. So we're going to do a slightly, subtly different uh, uh, outlook on, on this session. Uh, it's not just going to be a regular session. We're going to be a good cop and a bad cop. So let's first of all introduce ourselves. Yeah, this is me. My name is Alex Schleif. I come from Estonia. I work for a company called Zero Turnaround as a developer advocate. Uh, there are a couple of things that I do. Uh, I maintain uh, our blog called Rebel Apps, where we publish technical content. So if you're going to check it out, it will make me personally very happy. I am a co-leader uh, with Simon of a virtual jug, which is the Java uh, online-only Java user group. So if you're lazy enough to join your local Java user group, we will welcome you and we'll be happy to have you. Uh, and I'm also a leader of a GGG group in Tartu in Estonia which is a very small town, but a very proud one. <laughs> um, so I also work with the London Jug and the Virtual Jug, and uh, I work in developer relations as well. Uh, so I work as a developer advocate for uh, Zero Turnaround. Um, but uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, so Java 9, the debate. The way this is going to work is we're going to play good cop, bad cop. Um, we're going to take a number of the major Java 9 and some of the minor Java 9 updates and one of us is going to play a good cop, one of us is going to play a bad cop. So the good cop will look at some of the, 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 the positive parts of that feature. The bad cop will look at perhaps some of the parts of that feature which aren't so good. And when you, as the jury, have heard both the pros and the cons, you will vote as to whether you like that feature in Java 9 or not, or whether it's something enough for you to migrate up, perhaps. Um, the way it works is, uh, if I'm good cop or I'm bad cop, you always vote for whatever I say, because I like to win. Um, and just ignore Oleg, really. That's probably what I'll, what I'll say. So let's start. Before we start, before we start, let's not get into this debate so fast. Who's excited? So Java 9 was cooking for a long time, and then it was released. And people, some people are excited about that. Some people are not that excited about that. So let's vote in the beginning of the session, before we heard all our arguments, whether it's good or bad. Who is excited about Java 9? Woo! <laughs> See, if you, if you would do that in Estonia, that would never happen. That would never happen. We, we might have a guest from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Welcome, Paul. Who is not excited about Java 9 and is kind of disappointed with this release? A few people. OK. Excellent. Woo! <laughs> right, so let's start, shall we? Yep. Modularity. And the elephant in the room. The, mod the, the big elephant in the room. So modularity, why do we need modularity? Well, we have modularity in a couple of different ways. We have platform modularity and we have application modularity. Um, we really need platform modularity because the way the, uh, the platform has got over many, many years requiring backwards compatibility, it's turned into really the elephant in the room, right? It's a huge beast that we need to support horrible things like Corba. Who likes Corba? No, no whooping, Paul? No? OK. We don't like Corba, but why do we have to have it? Because we have to support really old apps that need Corba, OK? But even if we don't want to use Corba, we have to still have it as part of our platform. So what we do is we modularize the platform into modules that we can choose whether we want to have in, in, in our runtime or not. And depending on what our application needs, uh, from, its, from its platform, we can bundle up a new runtime which only provides that. So we're creating a runtime based on the needs of our application rather than having this one size fits all JVM, and it is a big size fits all JVM for any application that wants to run on that Java platform. Um, you'll notice. Uh, at the bottom here, we have the, the java.base class. This is, this is the fundamental class which every application and everything must use. It contains things like your collections, the, everything that you need to use if you want any kind of Java application. Uh, we also have some compact profiles there, which you may recognize from other things. The lines are, 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 are dependencies. So if you, if you require a specific uh, bundle, uh, sorry, module, I'm an OSGI person as well, so this is Hertz. Uh, if, you, if you require a certain uh, module, like let's say here we have uh, scripting, uh, that module will in turn depend on base. So depending on which modules you require, you'll, you'll build up this dependency tree. 
Um, okay, we, we deal with modularity already. When we design things, we draw boxes. We write words in the boxes and we draw arrows between them. We design in a modular way. But when we write code, we write it very, very flat. Okay, we don't actually put, push that into, into a modularity, uh, into a mod modular way. And the reason is, up till now, we haven't had in, any enforcement in our runtime. Now, whether we're compiling or whether we're actually running in the runtime, uh, the, the platform will always enforce modularity. We can't compile against something if, if our module structure d determines that we don't actually depend on that module. Likewise, in our runtime, we can't start our runtime unless all the modules are present for the, for the application to run. So very, very key, both in com compilation and during runtime, that the module structure must be satisfied for us to, com to fully compile or fully run. That's very important. But this is the first time we've had uh, enforcement. Now, yes, we have the module path. We still have the class path. So if you wanted to still use the class path, you can. Although under the covers, everything is still modular in, a, in, in the platform. So you can't use things that are hidden from you. So what's hidden from you? Well, in modules, you have encapsulation. What the module exports is what other modules can use. What the module depends on, what it requires, that's the, that creates the module graph. So. Uh, if, a if, a, if an application is running on the class path, it's still running on a modular uh, JVM. But if you choose to use the module path in your application, then both your, both your platform and your application will be running in a modular way. But you don't necessarily need to do both. Uh, wow, that looks painful, doesn't it? Um, as a result, the unsafe API. <laughs> Uh, which many of you have heard of, mostly probably frameworks and libraries. Uh, the unsafe API is, uh, is going to be hidden from you. It was an API which was, which was meant to be uh, an internal API. But as I said before, there is no enforcement previously. So people were using it, and actually for good reason, because there's some great stuff in there, and it's made our ecosystem richer. Um, Let's, let's do a demo, yeah? should, we see, should we see a demo? Actually, you've probably already seen how, how module info.jar, has anyone seen, not seen a uh, module demo? Got a few people, okay, I'll show you, I'll show you a, a demo just with services. Um, so I'm gonna go over to IntelliJ. Uh, let's clear some of this up. So in IntelliJ right now, I have, uh, I have three modules, three J9 modules. I have org.0turnaround.api. Actually, let's start with consumer. Consumer is our consumer module. Uh, that actually goes to the provider via an API. Now, our API, if we just quickly have a look at that, um, is, let me turn this down. Right, uh, API is very simple. It's got my service, and it just has a single method called get message. Uh, in our module info.java, we just export that package. So this is a module containing code that is then exposed to the rest of the module system. Um, our consumer, uh, where's our consumer here? No, that's our provider, sorry. Our consumer here has a single class called consumer. Wow, that's not very, uh, that's not very good, is it? Um, there we go. Our consumer just has a main method. It, it spins around in a loop calling call services. Call services just does a system printout uh, of a counter looking for services. That counter is incremented. Uh, we sleep for a second, and then we print out nothing at all. So it does pretty much nothing yet, but uh, there's a little spoiler for you in the middle, which we won't talk about just yet. Um, the next thing is the provider. And the provider impl, uh, all the provider impl does is the provider impl implements my service uh, and uh, implements the get message method. Okay, so we have a provider which implements the service. We have a consumer which will soon grab that service, uh, and that's pretty much it. So I'm going to run this. I'm actually going to run it using Jrebel, so we, we'll be able to code and update it as we as we go. Um, there's Jrebel loading, and now here we have our loop looking for services, but there's no services there. So how do we actually use services? Well, we use it via the service loader, and the service loader is actually something which was what one six, maybe one four, something like that. Um, and uh, it's been there, and, and uh, the modularity system uses the same service loader. We can register things with it, uh, and we can grab grab services from there. So what I'm going to do is first of all, I'm going to uh, I'm going to actually make sure we're using the service loader. So in our consumer, in our module, what I'm going to say here is I'm going to say that we use uh, a specific uh, service. So that's going to be org dot zero turn around dot api dot my service. So we're now saying 
uh, that we're going to be using that service. So I'm going to hit save. I'm going to rebuild my application. Uh, there we go. So that's been reloaded live into the environment. Still not got any services. And the, one of the reasons for that is, well, we're not actually grabbing any services from the service loader. So I'm going to come back in here. I'm going to uncomment this. This is a great way of, this is a great new style of development. It's called uh, development via uncoding. You get far fewer bugs. It's amazing. I don't know why more people don't do it. Um, so we go to the service loader. We say load all services of the interface my service. We actually get iterable back of my services. Uh, we go through that and we just try and call get message on that. So I'm going to hit save. I'm going to reload that into my runtime. And there we go. It's reloaded. But we're still not getting anything back. And that's because no services have been registered. Now, the way to register a service is uh, in my provider class. Here we go. Provider impl. Uh, we have our provider impl, which I showed you. In our module info.java, what we actually need to say is we need to say what we're going to do is we're going to provide um, the, the, the class org.0 turn. Let me just get rid of that. Turn around dot uh, api dot my service and we're going to provide that oops we're going to provide that uh, with uh, the org dot uh, zero turn around dot uh, provider dot provider impl. So we're saying we're going to provide the service and here is our implementation and what that's going to do when I save that and f9 that that's going to reload in. And all of a sudden, we're getting a service back. Our service is just returning underscore. What that simple provides meshes does is that the, the Java runtime is under the covers, registering that service with the service loader. And then when we actually use that by another, by another module uh, and actually perform a lookup into our, uh, our service loader, we're grabbing that service back. And just to prove that that is the service, I can go into our provider impl if I wanted to. And uh, let's say. Uh, let's say this is uh, from uh, plus uh, this dot get class oops dot get name hit save let's reload that and then you'll get the name of the class uh, which is oops there we go uh, from well, dot zero turn around dot provider impulse so that's that's the modules um, whoa that was a bit weird wasn't it there we go so that's Java nine modules um, before we uh, go on to much more I just want to say the modules uh, hasn't just been available there for the platform and to, to allow us to have more modular applications, but because of the module system, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard of the new release cadence in Java going forward is going to be every six months. So next March, we're going to have what is likely going to be called an 18.3 release. Then next September, we're going to have an 18.9 release. The reason this is possible is because of the module system. By having, the, by having everything as modules, it's much, much easier to make our updates, um, push, that into, push that into the new runtime with, uh, you know, in a single module without having too many dependencies on other modules. Uh, we can also use a tool called JLink, which allows us to uh, reduce the size of our, of our runtime. Using JLink, we can say, this is my application. Provide me with a Java image that will allow you to uh, only use the platform modules you need. And it will provide you with like a 40 meg image rather than this huge image. And that will, that will allow you to run the, the, you know, the JVM with your application. And it's much, much faster, smaller footprint. Um, and also, incubate. We'll talk a little bit about HTTP2 later, but it wasn't ready because we needed more community feedback. But now what we can do is we can release a module as an incubator, which will allow for that community feedback, and then at a later stage, we push it into the main OpenJDK. So not only as modules provide us with a much nicer way of, of developing our code, but it has also allowed us, with all these new freedoms, to release Java quicker, to have smaller runtimes, uh, and to actually you know, play with Java more with incubators. So I, I think we should just vote now. I don't think there's a bad cop in here, is there? Is that good? <coughs> That's pretty amazing. Uh, modules are excellent. As Simon said, we have a smaller footprint. We have faster release cadence, which has nothing to do with modules. But the features we can get to us sooner. So before we go forward, we, we, we need to assess every feature, not just by what it gives us or what other people say it gives us, but what it actually uh, does it solve a problem for us. And we have to remember that modules built in the JDK as they are were designed to solve a problem for the JDK developers. It wasn't in the job, it wasn't in the plan to devise a modular system to build consumer applications from scratch. We had that opportunity to have OSGI in our systems. 
right? We didn't choose that. Most of us didn't choose that. Who uses OSGI? <coughs> Excellent. You're good people. Uh, some of us didn't choose that. And, and so modules solve really nice problem of developing an open JDK and enforcing the rules and integrity of the open JDK uh, better. <clears throat> but what is the cost? The cost is very simple. On the language level, that, uh, th this is like five new keywords, a new module info file, and a lot of pain with actually migrating old projects to the Java 9. If you work on the Greenfield projects, you start from scratch, this is amazing, and you would love it. If you actually uh, have an application that is several gigabytes, uh, several thousand files big, then you would perhaps have a problem. You would have a problem with the build systems, you will have a problem with ecosystem where some, some libraries don't actually migrate or unsupported or maintained any further, and all that can cause you trouble. So when you are getting excited of, about the modules, you have to know that there is a migration path. So before the migration path was a little bit unclear up to the very last moment of the release of Java 9, but currently we think that this is the idea how to migrate further. So what do you want to do? You don't want to upgrade your development environment immediately and start modularizing everything. What you want to do, you want to upgrade your, you cannot upgrade your production environment out of the blue because that's just unwise. So you want to upgrade your staging environment or something where you can try it out, you can benefit from the other improvements that are in Java 9, and then you want to fix the easiest things that you can potentially fix concerning the module system. Currently, it is not enforced to the very strictest level by default, but you can turn it on if you want, if you want additional work fixing those errors. But you can fix the warnings and then you wait for some time. Preferably somewhere until April 2018. First, you will have the new major release of Java. And second, probably the ecosystem will catch up and you can migrate to modules bottoms up, starting from the libraries. You can also migrate the other way around, but it's much harder. So when you think about the modules, keep this picture in mind. Out of those two people, who do you think is a developer and who is an architect? <laughs> the feature of the, like modules will benefit architecture uh, concerns very uh, greatly, but for a developer, it could be a lot of pain. So the good thing is Unsafe is still accessible, so we can do stuff under the covers. So, so modularity, let's yeah. vote. So who thinks, <coughs> who thinks that modularity has saved the Java language and is, has actually made the Java language uh, more sustainable for the future? Who believes that modularity is a good thing in Java 9? Oh, yeah, there we go, there we go. Okay, who believes that Java 9 release and migration will not be easy? Like, I, I believe that, <laughs> come on. But, but, but that's, not, that's not the question. <laughs> But that is the answer. No. Let's go further, though. Let's let's let's. So I, I win that one, right? I win that one. I'll I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. Uh, yay modules. Let's talk about other features. So let's look at the garbage collection because this is something that does uh, makes Java great. And from the beginning of the times, we had the managed memory, and we all use application resource, the hardware resource in the memory as it is infinite, and it is absolutely perfect. So what comes in Java 9, it comes a new default garbage collector called G1GC. If you think of the Java heap, Java memory, you probably think of a picture of something like this. You have the heap, it is separated in different regions. Uh, there is the uh, Eden space where the new objects are allocated, and then when they leave long enough, if they're survivors, they get promoted to the general space, and then they become the old generation. The hypothesis here is very simple. The old objects that already survived a couple of GC cycles, they probably will survive more. So it doesn't make sense to uh, collect the memory from the whole space, but it's better to split that into different regions, and then you can perform smaller garbage collections and save time on that. So the latency of a single garbage collection cycle will go down. And so now with G1 GC, this concept is pushed into not to the extreme, but much uh, further. What G1GC does, it splits your heap into very small regions, and then they all are allocated, and the objects are allocated in them randomly. They still have the types, so in some of them there will be young objects, in some of them there will be old objects, and the objects are moved all the time, 
But the main benefit of that is that the garbage collection can decide how many of those small regions it can collect at any given moment, and through that it can control what is your garbage collection pause. With that, you can do magnificent things. First, you, the latency of the garbage collection goes down. Second, you can adaptively uh, control that. So you don't have to have like a spreadsheet of JVM options to tune your garbage collection. In fact, to tune your garbage collection now, what you want to do, you want to just say, this is my requirements uh, for the garbage collection pauses, and this is my requirements for how much space I can sacrifice to achieve that uh, latency number. And this is all garbage collection tuning that is required with G1, GC. Well, there were, of course, more to that, but uh, in a normal conversation, we can stop at that. So G1, GC is pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and this is how it became to us. It came to us. It was introduced in JDK 6. It was tested, so it's a very mature technology. You could have used that before. Very many companies tried that tested that on different workloads, and it works beautifully, and now it is getting to all of us in JDK 9. So when you run your applications on, on, on Java 9, they will probably run a little bit faster in terms of uh, having smaller garbage collection pauses. It does trade off some throughput, maximal throughput, because the garbage G1 GC will run concurrently with your application, so not the full resources of your hardware will be available to you, but for most applications, especially for applications where the latency is important, this is a very great thing. I think the next one is yours. Yeah, so to summarize that, you get the faster memory management with fewer application tricks. So is G1GC a good thing? Well, some performance experts say yes, some performance experts say no. Ultimately, it really depends on your application. You need to test it with your application. But the question is, is G1GC exciting in, in Java 9? Well, let me actually uh, go back to a couple of things. This was introduced in JDK 6. That was before my five-year-old son was born. Tested and supported in JDK 7. That was before my five-year-old son was born. Officially, the default GC in JDK 9. Who cares? You could use it any time you wanted before JDK 9 just with this switch. And if you are using a specific, a specific uh, a GC in your, in your JVM arguments, it's not even going to affect you because you're going to continue to use that in, in JDK 9. So is G1 GC a good thing? Yeah, it probably is. It gives you choice. Is it good in, Java, in JDK 9? Well, it's good in JDK 9. Is it good as in JDK 8 and 7 and 6? It's always been there, pretty much. So that's my argument as to why G1 GC isn't a big deal in JDK 9. Who agrees with me that, as a result, it's not a big deal in JDK 9? <laughs> OK, this might be closer. And easily. It would be go different in Eastern Europe. I'm so Adam, who, who, believes it is a good, who believes it is a really good thing in JDK 9? Oh, yeah, that is close. I'd call it pretty even. Yeah, pretty even? OK. Right. Next one. Uh, yeah, on that. We just did that. J Shell. Who's heard of J Shell? Pretty much everyone. Who loves J Shell? Who hates J Shell? Yeah, right. OK. <laughs> good. I'm glad because I'm good cop here for J Shell. OK. Wait, let's stop. Who thinks J Shell is a gimmick? Reasonable people. Right, you, you can leave, you guys, because <laughs> I'm good cop here. Right. So J shell, J shell is a REPL, and a REPL stands for? Redevel program close? Print loop, there we go, Redevel print loop. Uh, let's just jump into a demo, shall we? OK. Say again? It's not that kind of REPL. It's, uh, it's a REPL. So I just type J shell, and that puts me into a really nice console. Is that, is that readable from the back? Thumbs up, good. Right, so it puts me into a console. Here I am in a console. I can talk to the JDK. I can talk to uh, the shell. If I wanted to talk to the JDK, uh, I just put something as simple as 1 plus 2, and that gets me 3. If I wanted to talk to the shell, I just put a slash. And as soon as I put a slash, I'm not talking to the JDK. So I have a number of things I can do. Um, so one of the other things I'll mention there is when I put 1 plus 2, I didn't, actually, I didn't actually assign it to a variable. So what it's actually done is it's assigned it to a variable for me with a dollar $1. If I wanted to do something similar, like int x equal, actually, no, I was going to put underscore. I'll put double underscore because I can. Uh, double underscore uh, equals 2 plus 3. Oops. 2 
plus three. I noticed Mark Reinhold just walked in, that's why I did that. Uh, two plus three, and you get five. So um, now it's double underscore there. How cool is that, Mark? That's brilliant that you've left that in for us. I type slash v, uh, and, th and that, gives me, that gives me the, vari the current variables that we've, that we've got. Um, if I wanted to do something interesting like system, oh, actually, no, can, you, can anyone tell me what's missing there? Let me just put that at the top. What's missing there? Semicolon. We can, we can code Java without semicolons. How good's that? It's amazing. That's, just wor that's worth a whoop, if nothing else <laughs> is worth a whoop. J just um, a groovy. Yeah, uh, let's do a thread.sleep. Oops. Wow, no try catch. How cool is that? Um, <laughs> if, I, if I do a, I don't know, a public void, say hello. Uh, and then here I can just do something like system. Whoops, system dot out dot print. Oh, do me print lin. Hello. At this point, because I'm doing multi lines, it obviously needs a uh, obviously needs a semicolon. Uh, so when I do that, we now have a method. So I can type slash m and we get a method. Uh, I can slash edit that. Uh, say, oh dear, I actually did a uh, capital. Say hello, and we get this amazing 1970s window pop up. <laughs> and from from here, I can say hello world. I can I can say accept that, and you'll notice that that uh, that is actually updated there. I can exit. I can execute that. Apologies for uh, for making that a uh, a capital S by the way. Uh, and we get hello world, so I can do that. We can also uh, add classes and things like that if I wanted to. I, I, oops. So I can say uh, class A. We get a class A. I can say interface. Oops, interface B. Uh, we get our interface. I can type slash T. We get our type. So it's it's pretty much just you know using using uh, a, a who, who's used a REPL before for, with other languages. So it's, yeah, it's great. We can we can use there, there is I think it's JavaRepl.com was what we could use previously, but this is nicely connected straight into the OpenJDK. Um, yeah, other things like you can check uh, what's imported. Uh, other things, if I wanted to, I can just type a uh, list, and I can see everything that I've typed in to the JDK. I can also type to, uh, slash history, and I get everything that I've typed, whether to the JDK or to the console itself. If I wanted to, I can save that as uh, commands. I can slash reset, uh, which resets my state. So if I now type slash v, I get nothing. Uh, but what I can do is I can open commands. And this is actually just saving it as a... Um, as a text file, and now it's run everything. So you saw that one second uh, delay. Then you saw the, you know the creation of everything. Then you see hello world. Uh, so that's JShell. JShell's pretty pretty awesome. Oh, one other thing actually. Uh, if I uh, slash exit, this is I'm going to use a Vencat line here. Depending on how how happy you're feeling at the time, you can exit in two different ways. You can either Command D if you're feeling you know like. You don't really want anyone to talk to you if you're feeling a bit down. If you're feeling down and you need some, you need a hug. Just type slash exit. And it says goodbye. How nice is that? <laughs> um, so there we go. Uh, right. If you, if you if you type J shell and you just type printing, something that, something very very nice that we get. Um, it's a little bit mucky in that all it all it actually does is if if I type look at the methods, it provides me the whole list of prints, so I can then type. Uh, oops, I can type print. Hello or Hellop, whichever you choose, <laughs> and uh, and that you know it's much much nicer. You don't have to system out printing and stuff, things like that. One thing I will say, which is absolutely awesome, and it's great that Mark's in the room actually, because I'll, I'll say it, I'll say it so Mark can hear. I'm sure he's heard it before. Heinz Kibbutz did a really really great video. It's about 30 minutes long or so, and one thing he did was he actually created a, a, a script with a with a, a hash bang. And passing in J shell and and then a script with some with some Java code and and by doing that you can actually execute J shell as if you were like a bash script or something like that. It, it throws an exception. I don't know if it still does that. Maybe, uh, but it throws an exception. But you can ignore that and then just and then it just <laughs> runs uh, runs Java like a script. How cool is that? But uh, yeah, that's J shell. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, over to you for a uh, bad cop. Yeah, we we, we yeah. JShell is brilliant, and it's going to change the way how people learn Java and how people get into uh, using Java, especially the small humans, uh, children, uh, children. Uh, and and uh, JShell is pretty amazing. At the same time, it's really hard to imagine that JShell would change the way we develop software. It's pretty hard to type in like a significantly large program into a single shell. There is this reason why Simon didn't show you how to create an annotation. 
uh, there is no reason you can create annotations in JShell, but it just takes a little bit more typing. So while it's a it's a great thing, it feels a little bit gimmicky. Personally, I would love to see the feature where you can connect your JShell to a running JVM process, Java process, right, and execute commands uh, within the context of that process. I, as far as I know, currently you cannot do that. You can embed JShell and create like a console in your app, but you have to think about that like beforehand. And if you think about that beforehand, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, it's a JShell is a, is a gimmick. All other languages have that. Now Java has that as well. Uh, Yay, Java. So who believes JShell is an interesting tool and you'll probably use it to test out APIs and things without having to you know, spawn up a whole browser and or not browser, an ID and do a whole bunch of extra things. Who, who likes the idea of just coding quick? OK, OK. Who here uses a proper IDE and hasn't done Java development in VI or Emacs for ages? And the all modern IDEs support some sort of like evaluation of expressions or it's like scratch pads or something. And they know that they will almost never touch the J shell at real job except for testing regex or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So modules, modules is a thumbs up, G1 G C it was a, a draw. And I think draw for J shell really. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's 50-50 for me. API updates. Uh, we can't really be a bad cop on API updates, so we're going to both be good cop for API updates because the API updates are always pretty awesome for Java developers. So, uh, so you're going to yeah. do the demo, right? You yeah, doing it on yeah. yours or here? Uh, I'll do it on yours. On mine? I mean, uh, obviously, I'm going to show you the new API using the gimmicky J shell. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Anyone want to change their vote now? Uh, this is not my machine, so my typing will be a little bit slow, but we'll manage. If we run out of time, please just tell me that we need to cover other things. Because there are many, many API improvements in Java 9, right? And we will not go through all of them. I'll show you a couple of that I like the most, or I think they are the most influ influential, maybe. And we'll see how much we can do. So one thing that we wanted from Java for ages, right? And everyone thought that this would be absolutely great to have that were collection literals. So we don't need to create the new array list and then on the subsequent statements populate that with uh, data. Now we have those. The collection literals in Java are here. Just kidding. The node collection literals, they are factory methods because we're talking about Java. So, but the thing, what you can do, you can talk about, uh, you can create a list of elements or a set of elements in a single line of code. And you populate that and it is a fully functional uh, implementation of the list interface, or you can do a set, uh, and you just type off, and you do the elements, and you have a set. Uh, you can also do a map where you will uh, just uh, provide the key and entry values in the, in the row, and it will create a map back to you. The good thing about this is that while it uh, simplifies the syntax, it also does very important things. The implementations of those classes are uh, very interesting. So if I do this and do get class, uh, what do you think I will get? Who thinks I will get an array list? A few people who will think I, I, I'll get a linked list. Smart. So in fact, I will get a new implementation that was just added in the Java 9. And it's an immutable list of one element. And one of the things is those uh, implementations are fairly heavily optimized. So that, for example, stores the element in the field. So it passes, but doesn't need to do the in array access. So it just reads the element directly because it's immutable and contains one element and so on. If you have a list of two elements, it's also heavily optimized, and there are like a collection of n elements and further. So those collection literals will make your code more readable, and it's going to be absolutely great to, to, to use those. One, one other interesting thing, actually, when you've got that get class, uh, if you just uh, grab that again, off that get class, you can actually do a dot, and I think is it, is it get module or module? Uh, get module. Just have it. Yeah, get module. So if you, if, you, if you do a get module there, you can, actually see, you can actually see which module that came from, which is kind of a nice, interesting thing to know about when you're, when you're developing as well. Yep, and then you remember that you're still on class pass and everything is great. <laughs> so besides that, there are a couple of things that, so in Java 8, we got the stream API and we got optionals in Java, and those are really great. And then in Java 9, there are a couple of improvements. One of my favorite is the stream method on the optional. So what I can do now is optional of say one, and I can do a stream of it. And I get a stream implementation. While it seems like an unreasonable thing to do, because an optional uh, provides you with the uh, 
stream-like methods for mapping functions over the values within the con optional container. It's very important. So if I do this 27, uh, 27 and I do a map function here, so I have an, an I apply a function, what do I get? Say x times 2. Uh, what will I get back? Will I get 4? Will I get an optional of 4? Or 1, 2. My math is terrible. Uh, no, in fact, I will, since stream is lazy by default, now if I convert optional into a stream, I will get the laziness of the stream uh, in my optional. So back I will get a reference pipeline and will need a terminal operation to actually uh, in, evaluate the function that they provided. So if I do just a normal thing, optional of one, and I will do a map immediately here, uh, I will get the result immediately. So if you have a functions, uh, you, ma you are mapping the functions which are uh, expensive performance wise and you don't maybe really need to evaluate them eagerly you can always convert an optional to stream very very easily another cool thing that is present in the optional optional uh, uh, what is it empty let's do the empty one previously we had the method called if present uh, which would take a function uh, which will evaluate only the, if the value in the optional is present now we can have the uh, method that takes two arguments uh, and it, called, it is called if present or else. And it takes two functions. So if it's present, then we have a function uh, and we do, I think we need this, a side effect here. Did you start with printing? Print. Uh, yes. Print x. And if it's not, then we just have a supplier uh, and we do print empty. I hope this works, empty. You can never know if it works or not. You know why? Because we're in J shell. <laughs> I, I love the I, I love the way I love the way it took you about four times to do that because you actually did a, a smiley instead of a, a quote thing. I'm a fairly optimistic person. <laughs> I'm, I'm very uh, rarely I'm a bad cop. So there are a couple of things uh, on the stream API. So if I take it in stream, and if I will type that correctly, and then we'll do a range. Uh, from 1 to 10. Now we have the methods to drop elements while and take while, which are pretty interesting. Uh, they're also present in all other uh, stream implementations. Uh, now we'll have them built in the JDK as well. So say we can drop the elements until a certain condition is met, and x smaller than 5, and then after that we will, for each, we'll print this element. And we see we dropped the first five elements. Also, you can just take a number of elements in, in from your stream. It's very useful if you just need, like, say, like five elements, uh, not the five elements, but like you need to take the events until some condition is met. For example, you want to skip the duplicates events or something. So the stream API was uh, enhanced as well. One, th one thing I like about this actually is the uh, take while. Um, so, for example, if you actually had an infinite stream and you don't want it to continue running and running and running, you might say, I'm going to take while while some other condition is met. And then when something, once some billion hits true, then you stop that infinite stream. You know, you're not going to kill a process to kill that stream. So that's, for me, quite interesting as well. Uh, yep. And another thing that was added was the uh, iterate method, where you can do the proper iteration. Uh, I will need to check the syntax on that. So you start with the start value, then you do the uh, increment step, and then you specify a condition. And before Java 9, it was quite clumsy to do that because there was no iterate method to do that. Uh, but now we can do that if it's less than 10, and then we, for each, we print them, uh, print x, and uh, uh, is that the way around? Yeah. See. A proper ID would suggest me to do that. <laughs> I should know this is exactly like a for loop. But now we, you can generate uh, streams normally, like you would do uh, because you have some condition. And then from a sequence of values, uh, you have the step. And it's a fairly interesting API to play with. Uh, there are some improvements for local date and time. There are some improvements for the process handles. The process, sub-process management uh, is interesting because before it was so messy in Java 9. And I will just show you that thing and then we'll go to the next, level, next things. 
There were also concurrency improvements. The complete build feature got a couple of new methods. There were also reactive classes in the uh, like flow, so we can get closer to the reactive programming, maybe in JDK uh, 18.3 or whatever the version ends up being. But with the process, process handle, uh, there is a new class, and you can do the uh, process handle current. Uh, you can do the sub-process management fairly easily. So you can get the current process, you can then execute some um, info and get some arguments. And you get. Uh, you can get the arguments for any processes. You can get the process uh, representation in your Java code. So if you deal with sub-processes or if you need to check any arguments, uh, you can differentiate with, within processes much easier. This is also cross-platform, which is fairly great because now everyone, everything runs in Docker, so now we especially need that cross-platform things. There are a bunch of improvements. My personal favorite is that now we can read the property files uh, in UTF-8. There is exactly one method that supports that, but we can do that, so if you can find it, that's very cool. The single underscore is not supported. This is now uh, unreasonable to type a thing like this. What will happen if I click enter? An exception, right? There is no type. Oh, no, there, there is no keyword. Keyword. If I do just two, two underscores, just like Simon did, I will have the name that there is no variable uh, type inference sufficient enough, and we will do but you can use two keywords. So you're going to check your source code for single underscores, and then you convert that. Uh, other uh, API language improvements, you can have private methods in the interfaces. So now with the default methods, you can, in private methods, you can actually put a lot of logic in your interfaces, which is amazingly great. And uh, there are a couple of other things. Oh, uh, let me just check. Yeah, if you use try with resources, this is fantastic. This is not the API improvement, language improvement. The try with resources blocks. Now you can use effectively final variables in the try with resources, so you don't need to declare them uh, within this little line of the try block, but you can declare them uh, somewhere above and then use them, reference them in the try with resources block, and they will be closed automatically at the end of that try block. So that makes the code much more readable, but it's really hard to show in JShell. So. Uh, but we're still super excited for the, for, the, for the API improvements. Okay, so let's jump here. <clears throat> okay, so the final few things that we'll, we'll talk about, HTTP2. Uh, HTTP2 is, is an incubator project rather than being in the, in the full, uh, uh, full JDK, which is what I mentioned before, so I won't talk about that for too long. This is your slide, Oleg. I don't know why you picked this, this picture. It's a, it's a, it's a picture uh, for Google search, Angry Hipster. And this was because the JSON, uh, JSON libraries and JSON manipulation did not make it into JDK 9, which is very great because we have plenty of third-party implementations and you can choose whatever. My currently personally is Moshi, uh, I think by Square. Uh, but yeah, some hipsters might be angry about that. Um, we'll save the best till last. Um, HTML5 Java Docs. And it is searchable. Yeah, so you can type in that little, hang on. See this little search box right on the side here? You can type something into there. I think you can actually just, so for completable future, for example, I think you can just do capital C, capital F. Is that right, Mark? Capital C, capital F, and it'll, it'll actually do the search for completable future as well. I'm pretty sure it does that. Um, so uh, yeah, you can, you can pretty much search for whatever you want there, and it, it actually does a smart search. So uh, yeah, welcome to 2005 with that one. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, we've got a few minutes left, maybe a couple of minutes left, two minutes left. So any questions? Maybe before the questions, because a couple of people are starting to leave, let's do another vote. So before, there were a couple of yeah. people who were not excited about Java 9. Let's try that again. Who is excited about Java 9 release? <laughs> who thinks that it's uh, a fairly eh, mediocre release as they go? There were a few before, but Jay Shell, I think, turned everyone. <laughs> um, so I'll say, I'll say a big thank you for everyone for turning up. Uh, we love uh, presenting at Java 1, so thank you for the full room. Um, please, 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 if you could vote for our session, that would be awesome. I will let you know, actually, as I was walking in, the guys told me that the yellow and the red buttons don't actually work. So, uh, yeah, if, if you feel like pressing the green button, we'd appreciate that very much. Thank you very much.
And if you don't like the presentation, uh, you can use J Rebel to redeem your 60 minutes back. Thank you.